Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, uh, Professor. Very nice talk on the topic. Um, I was just told that I have to cut short the presentation uh, in the interest of time, but still I will not lose those main areas which are practically important as a doctor, no matter wherever in your specialty you are. If, even if you are a surgeon, you will always encounter a patient with diabetes. Even if you are not an endocrinologist, you will always encounter patients with diabetes. It is rightfully said that it is as common as mankind. So this is the magnitude of this problem. Rest are just the numbers, but it is as common as mankind. So if you don't know diabetes, even from periphery, I think this is going to be reflecting in your practice adversely. So important to have basic concepts. So I will focus mainly on the talk today, like where, what is the cutting edge, where we are standing in terms of diabetes. We all know that insulin is good when we need it, but still there are gray areas. I will try to highlight, but still I will keep my talk very sharp and focused. So just beginning, how the diabetes basically affect? It is the disease of multi-organs. Nothing works properly when Nothing works properly like when somebody is having diabetes. Uh, like brain will not work properly because neurotransmitter will have dysfunction. So kidneys will start reabsorbing more and muscle will uh, stop taking sugar from the blood. So all this basically, body is singing the same song that there is hyperglycemia, there is hyperglycemia, every organ will reflect that. And then the malfunction starts gradually if it is kept unnoticed. So pancreas, there will be decreased insulin secretion. Even if there is a good secretion, body basically goes into a state of resistance. So these are all the areas. So <clears throat> what is very important is today that the patients who are diabetic, please do not ignore two parts of their care. One is the, what is the state of their heart and what is the state of their kidneys. These are very, very much part and parcel. They go together. So kidney disease is almost always present when patient is diagnosed with diabetes because there is a proteinuria almost always present, even if the creatine is fine. What happens when that there is diabetes, what we as in nephrology, we use a term called hyperfiltration. Hyperfiltration is a state in which it's like, imagine, if the heart goes into tachycardia, like 120, 140 beats, normally it is like uh, less than 100, what will happen? The, uh, the heart will compensate and let's say the blood pressure will never drop when the heart is compensating. So blood pressure is like synonymous with the creatinine. So when the patient is diabetic, actually sometimes you will see creatinine 0 0.4. Oh, your kidneys are good. Excuse me, no, kidneys are not good. This is hyperfiltration. Hyperfiltration is actually deceptive for many GPs and many doctors, even consultants. Oh, your creat no, creat kidneys are not in a good state of health. Why? Because this is, kidneys are like as if we speak the language uh, of the heart. They are beating very fast. There's a, a rapid hyperfiltration that is causing the creatine to reflect as if it is normal, but it is not. The moment you will put those patients on AC inhibitors, the real creatine number will show to you. That is how the doctors get deceived on this. Um, so just uh, getting to the point, so what are the basic aspects where we want to, <coughs> we want to improve our therapy for the patients? Uh, in addition to, there is, there is the heart we want to protect, there's a kidney we want to protect, and then there is uh, uh, the other thing which is important. I will come into those slides. Uh, the weight we also have to watch. So what happens, the major problem today is that the patient do not, we do not have, we have best drugs available. We have the best doctors available, but still people are dying of uh, morbidities and all the problems from diabetes. Well, who is, uh, who, who is responsible? I will not talk about that, but this problem is telling that there is still a major proportion of that is not being translated to the patient care. Um, so,
The goal of the talk today is also when we start therapy, the most important part is that we should know that those days are almost gone when we say that, okay, you just need one pill or monotherapy. Yes, there are some times we would like to use, but today we know that uh, because we want to make sure today we, uh, I share with you where we are at the cutting edge. We want to start early multiple drugs or at least combination drugs in the beginnings so that we prevent the kidneys and the heart and also we achieve the other goals which I will come back later to those. But this is the real important part. So I will just put a quick point on this slide. So all, always divide your patient into four segments, at least four. One, the kidney part, if they have a CKD, as I said that normal creatinine does not exclude it. Protein urea, yes, patient has CKD. Uh, if the patient has been hypertensive over five years, they have CKD even if the creatinine is normal. I think this is not topic on this discussion today, but uh, this is just a lesson we need to remember. Second is patient has a heart failure, atherosclerotic disease, and the other four, which is not on this slide, is the if patient is obese. So always categorize your patient into these four when you are dealing with if the patient is diabetic or not like how you're going to manage them. Uh, today, where we are, the, among these drugs which, we, which has revolutionized the care, are there are two groups. Uh, one of them is SGLT2 inhibitors, and the other one is the GLP-1, those drugs. What is common? One thing we always need to remember for the care of diabetes patient, all those drugs, which have stayed and be relevant today, if you, if you want to stay relevant in the care of diabetes, is that the drug needs to do two things. One, the need not only to lower the blood, the need not only to lower the blood sugar, but they also need to modulate the weight. So these are the two most important parts of the care. Almost decades ago when metformin came, it promised two things to us. It is going not only to uh, lower the blood sugar, but also it is going to help the patient lower the some degree of weight. It is still relevant today. All the drugs we are inventing today in US, all the drugs we are in the world being invented today, this is the sharp focus in diabetes care. The drug has to promise at least two things to us. Help control the blood sugar, we call it a glycemic control, we call it the patient to give us okay, good HbA1c and all those measures, but also help us to lower the weight. So that, that is the reason. So that is the reason we are going to say that where the other drugs came. So metformin remained favorite, but until when SGLT2 inhibitors came into existence, which I'm going to talk is empagliflozin is one of them, and there are other ones too. So why they also lowered the weight too. The other drug, which are injectable ones, what they do also, please keep this, keep this threat with you. It will help you to learn any future inventions in the, med, in the care for the diabetes. The, is the drug offering these two or not? So I will move forward, just wanted to share. So empagliflozin, these are the different studies, uh, like why it is helpful. So basically, in almost all studies, empagliflozin was, uh, it was outstanding in showing there was minimum heart failure, there was less hospitalizations, there were minimum CV death in those patients, and almost all, so emperor reduced, and you see that in the, over there, so 25% in the primary endpoint for the hospitalization, 35% secondary risk reduction, and 50% risk reduction actually for the kidney patients. Again, which drug? Empagliflozin, which one? SGLT2 inhibitor. What is this drug to begin with? The drug which offers two benefits. Drop the weight, at least to some extent, if not a lot, and second, also drop the sugar. So these are the two things you need to know, any drug that we are going to move forward. So among the SGLT2 inhibitors, these are the trials where, again, empagliflozin has stayed out. I will, there's a there's an important slide which I want to highlight, which will help you to learn the benefits of empagliflozin. So empagliflozin, 
first it was launched alone then later on they thought okay let's combine it with the other uh, <clears throat> dpp whole inhibitors like uh, these drugs to just have the maximum benefit among those gliptins like uh, sitagliptin we know like vildagliptin the one which has remained outstanding again was the one uh, linagliptin i will come back to those why this is like a really linking two stars empagliflozin among the all flozins like depagliflozin and the other flozins it has shown the benefits over others although glycemic benefit was almost pretty much same but the safety profile was very good for both so empagliflozin and linagliptin so linagliptin is the one which you can offer once a day dose sitagliptin it is not once a day dose you have to use it twice daily dose and it is also like a uh, vildagliptin very very short half life so uh, linagliptin has a very good half life and it stays in the blood for long i just want to highlight here so there's no adjustment needed uh, for the dose with the linagliptin and uh, so it does not have any effect on the weight uh it does not cause this hypoglycemia good tolerance major cardiovascular risk fact uh, events very minimum with all the studies carolina and other showed so this is the these are the few slides which i want all the practicing family doctors and gps i think they can take home something good from this one i just want to come over here so this is one of my favorite slide I think if you want to take home, please take home this one. It will help you for long. Even if you are a cardiologist, nephrologist, endocrinologist, one of the best one to say. I will spend a few minutes here. So, SGLT2 inhibitors, these are the drugs. They actually have the many organs they affect on, but very important, the kidneys. As I said that the EGFR is almost always dropping if you have not seen behind the numbers you have missed it so what it does this drug actually uh, SGLT2 inhibitors this is a class effect not just I'm talking about empagliflozin I'm talking about the class O whole which has included the sitagliptin and the other uh, sorry the uh, other depagliflozin as well so what they do they go to the proximal tubule and they tell the proximal tubules you cannot reabsorb the glucose those channels they are they have two ends one has sodium and the other has the glucose what happens when they stop one the sodium is also blocked so basically body is losing glucose body is losing sodium very very important and desired effect this this part is actually they have made them the favorite drug for managing the patients in icu also those with a heart failure as well so what happens the blood sugar because these drugs l drop the sugar in the urine glycosuria happens when the sugar leaves the body it will low it will be low in the blood so hypoglycemia or actually glycemic control is achieved so endocrinologist is happy one person happy endocrinologist when glucose leaves the body it is a body's energy so over the period of time the patient's weight will also be low so glucosuria eventually causes the weight loss at least one to two kilos you can say over 24 months in several studies it has been shown so who is happy here the person who is like a obesity specialist i'm also a obesity specialist too so glycosuria will do that the third part is natriuresis so these are actually inbuilt diuretic fact please make a note inbuilt diuretic fact this is why for SIGA, every time I see, I round in ICU in US, patient is in acute heart failure, we start for SIGA right away. Just closing it. So these two parts are important. So heart failure benefit, cardiologists will also use them a lot. So as you see in that, the weight loss, yes. SGLT2, they have the benefit on it. So remember, we started from metformin. Why it has been still present on the, uh, in the medication list for diabetes? Because it does both. Just closing over here. 
why these uh, combinations, uh, empagliflozin and linagliptin, all these studies have shown that the patient has, when we combine these two like a star-like drugs, it is excellent response in the patient care, once daily dose, patient CKD progression is, is actually, if not halted, it is slowed, patient's protein urea is slowed, and patient also does not develop edema. Many of the CKD patients, they have peripheral edema. So one drug and actually a lot of benefits. That is where the only time I want you to watch uh, SCLT2 inhibitors. After this, I will uh, just finish my talk. When not to use it. SCLT2 inhibitors, they cause glucosuria. Glucosuria is basically showing up, glucose showing up in the urine. When glucose shows up in the urine, bacteria love to grow. So UTI is a risk for that. So patient will have UTI or can develop UTI, and I will not start these drugs if patient is currently having UTI or you're treating UTI. That is one time when you don't want to give them. Yes, they can cause sometimes ketoacidosis, so I will not start the hospitalized patients who are having very, very poor control sugar. But when it is not a risk, then you can start it. The other thing I want these two drugs to remember is that empagliflozin is better from all other drugs, because even if the GFR has gone up to 20, because depagliflozin, you not, do not use it if the GFR is below 45. But this one, you can use it. That's all. I think, thank you.